and I am tasked to introduce Judge Gallagher. Again, I am Anita Laster Mays, and I am the administrative judge of the 8th District Court of Appeals. And uh, Judge Gallagher, I've been knowing Judge Gallagher for who? Too long. Too long, yes. And uh, Judge Gallagher, when um, I was in the clerk's office with Earl Turner, or even I think I was a uh, prosecutor, I believe I met uh, Judge Gallagher. And uh, he has served in so many capacities um, with the court. He always talked about how he started off as a janitor. And then um, I believe he was a janitor over at juvenile court. And he uh, learned or he decided from what he was seeing, you know, his desire to go back to school and become a lawyer. And uh, he worked as a bailiff and a uh, probation officer and uh, Cleveland Municipal Court judge. And he has been now on the uh, Eighth District Court of Appeals since 2003, he ran, so 2004. Um, he uh, is very knowledgeable um, with uh, things with the court. Sometimes I tease him and tell him he'll throw a rock and hide his hand because he'll get us all into discussion. <laughs> Uh, at the court and he said I'm not gonna come to that meeting but uh, y'all talk about it <laughs> but uh, I love him to death and um, one of the things that I do admire about him is that he loved the history of the law and so you can ask him anything about um, who's a Dore map uh, <laughs> uh, uh, so the map case the Terry case he have all the photos, just everything um, with it. And so when he uh, gives a, uh, a lecture or a discussion, he will have that background to keep you interested and keep you engaged. So at this time, I would like to introduce my friend, Judge Sean Gallagher. She's my favorite administrative judge. To quote the late, great Larry Jones our dear friend. Uh, so um, I think I'm, I, first of all, I did bring you the lovely Irish weather. Uh, if you want to know what an after Friday afternoon in Dublin is like, just go outside. This is it. Uh, but it's really great. But we're going to start out with a, with a very brief clip. So uh, Maestro, take it away.
go back. Uh, Bridget. <laughs> oh, there we go. Okay, so um, uh, that was a scene from The Lovers. And uh, I'm going to talk today about Jacobellus versus Ohio, which is a very famous case. All of you read it in law school. Even if you don't really remember it, it was about obscenity in the First Amendment. And uh, it gave birth to the phrase, I know it when I see it. We all use that phrase in our everyday lives. Uh, we certainly learned about Jacobellus and the law and what the First Amendment meant back at that time. But uh, really, that phrase has gone on, like I say, to mean so many different things to so many different people. But one of the things about these cases that I find very fascinating is not just when we learn the law in law school or in our daily legal lives, but I like to peel back the onion and take a look at the people that were actually in the case. What were their lives like? Who were they? Who were their families? Where did they grow up? What did they do and all that kind of stuff. So I like to consider it like a little bit of a backstory. So we're going to tell the backstory of Jacobellus versus Ohio, which is a very famous case. It happened right here in Cleveland, Cleveland, Ohio, and Cleveland Heights to be exact. But uh, we're, we're exactly 1.9 miles from where this took place. I Google mapped it. So let's think back to the culture of the late 1950s. There was very much a sense of uniformity that pervaded American society. Uh, Young and old were very homogenized. Uh, there were shared experiences that reflected accepted and expected social patterns. You know, you were expected to behave a certain way, act a certain way. Uh, we'd like to think that's still true today, but we know that's not always the case. But there was a very standardized sexual morality code that was the dominant theme or social principle that perversed America. Um, now, for me, being an Irish Catholic in this country, we had this character. And I describe him as a character because he would dress up in these elaborate, uh, uh, very religious garb. And he was on the radio in the 40s. And then in the 50s, he got a television show and he would wheel out a blackboard and present a moral problem. Uh, and then he would draw like, you know, things on the blackboard and quotes and everything else. And at the end of his one hour special, he solved your moral dilemma for you in a very structured, conservative, um, you know, Catholic manner. But uh, there were many versions of Bishop Sheehan, and, and he, certainly he was a brilliant man, and I certainly wouldn't be at this, I don't mean that as a criticism of him, he, he was very bright and offered a great deal of thought and wisdom to the, to the topic. But it wasn't unique to, uh, you know, white America too. I think the African American community, uh, most whites don't know of this individual, Gardner Taylor, Reverend Taylor. And uh, if you go back, you can uh, find, there's about 2,000 of his uh, speeches or lectures, and he He's like a predecessor of Dr. King. King got a lot of influence from him. He predates the civil rights movement, but he was a civil rights activist in his own right, but a very interesting fellow. But he was similar to Sheehan, and uh, Bishop Fulton Sheehan, in the sense that he also provided this like moral compass that everybody was supposed to be guided by. Now, in, in American television, it wasn't limited to the religious things. American television also presented this very homogenized view of of sexual morality. And Father Knows Best is probably the best example of it. Uh, this is uh, Robert Young and Jane Wyatt, who played the role. There were, I think, 203 episodes of this that were aired in American television between 1954 and 1960. And uh, they were Mr. and Mrs. Anderson on the show. And what would happen is they had these kids. And of course, the kids would present a moral dilemma at the start of the show. And then, of course, Mr. Anderson would go about solving the moral dilemma for them within the 29 minute show period, you know, so it was all wrapped up neatly at the end of the show. And that, you know, it tended to reinforce this moralism that we had at the time in America. Now we have a prequel to the Jacobellus versus Ohio story. And I kind of discovered this case by accident and the facts and circumstances of this, but I think, you know, in American society today, it seems everything has to have a prequel, right? I mean, I'm not a TV watcher, but I did watch um, Better Call Saul. You know, and then I found out that there was this Breaking Bad that was before or after Better Call Saul. So, and then my wife watches all these ones, Yellowstone and all that. And I mean, everything's got a prequel now, uh, even the big movie things, right? I mean, you got to have a prequel for this. So I got to have a prequel today, I guess. That's just the nature of life, but I'm, I'm going to have a prequel. So this gentleman is um, Angelo Jabaris. Um, and he was a Greek immigrant who came to the United States just after World War I. 
And he, he, his goal was to kind of strike it rich in America. Uh, and I actually found an interesting news article about him in the early 30s that, that was published uh, here in Cleveland that gave a little background about him. It was kind of, kind of a fascinating story. Uh, Javaris ends up going to, to a receiver at the then Squire Sanders and Dempsey. And he ends up buying this property, which was at 1773 East 9th Street. It's roughly, for Clevelanders, it's roughly around where Walnut and 9th is, Short, Minson, and 9th, right in that area around there. But it was called Gene's, he named it Gene's Fun House, but he also went by the name Funny House. Um, so kind of an interesting thing. Well, Gene's was an interesting business because it was kind of like a penny arcade type place and... Uh, it also was like a novelty shop. It sold novelties and things like that. Uh, but it had a little something more. Jeans offered you uh, a little something more. It offered you the opportunity to view some certain films and they were 25 cents. Now think about this, this place opened in 1932. So you could pay 25 cents in 1932 to watch one sixth of a movie. Now you may want to wonder what were these movies, Judge Gallagher? <laughs> Well, I didn't, my research did not take me quite that far into the, but I did get some of the titles, which was uh, Turkish Baths, uh, Plaster of Paris, which I have no idea where they were going with that, <laughs> yeah. uh, but a few others, but uh, these were not sex films in the sense you might view that today. These were, for lack of a better term, female disrobing videos. So they were basically women that disrobed on camera and with some theme around them. But think about it, 25 cents in 1932 to 38, that depression era, how much money that was, $1.25 in the 30s to watch the full film would be quite a bit of money. So this had to be a pretty lucrative business. Um, but like anything else, uh, and this, I had to put this picture in the slide. So police would raid these places every once in a while, you know, and it was like, you know, like they would get a call from somebody or whatever, Hey, go raid the whatever shop or go, you know, and they would go in there and seize magazines, books, films, whatever it was. And, you know, after the raid was over a uh, few weeks would go by and then everything would go back to normal. Right. The films would be back in there, you know, and, and I'm sure that I, I don't want to disparage the police, but I'm sure in the 30s, there were people getting paid off. I it just, you know, maybe I watched too much television, but but I found this photo in the Cleveland Memory Project. And uh, it was a news photo where the police that had come or the news media had accompanied the police on a raid. And I don't know what this guy's doing with his pants there. In the image, but if you look closely, <laughs> he was in the article. He was he was identified as the unidentified man. <laughs> Hopefully his wife did not read the paper. <laughs> um, so kind of interesting, but so uh, this is a, this is a photograph that appeared in the paper on April 2nd, 1943. Uh, so this is detective Edward Flanagan peering into the thing. And that's Angelo Javaris, the owner in the background. And they're looking at, Flanagan is described as observing the evidence. And I think in this particular raid, um, they, they seized 14 peep show movies, and this was the quote in the paper, were not good for the morals of children reportedly frequenting this place, and as well as eight pinball machines. So uh, uh, that was the, the haul from that particular raid in 1943. Now, this transformed a little bit more in October of 1957. The police came back again, but it was a little bit of a different scenario at this stage. Uh, uh, Angelo Javaris in 1954 was charged with tax evasion for not paying his taxes in 1945, 46, and 47. There was something like an eight year statute of limitations or something on, on that at the time. And uh, he ended up uh, getting convicted and he ended up going to prison. Uh, he owed $90,000 in back taxes. Can you imagine in the forties, how much, if you owed 90,000 in taxes, you were hauling in a, quite a bit of money. Uh, he paid, I, the article said he paid $5,400 of a $95,400 tax bill. So quite a bit of money. So his wife uh, took over the business. Her name was Gertrude Javaris. And of course, Angelo was in jail for tax fraud. She operated the fun house in Angelo's absence. She was 45 years old with two children. Uh, uh, she continued showing the films with women disrobing. 
And with this raid in 1957, she's charged with uh, obscenity. Uh, and a trial commences in June of 1958 before Judge John J. Mann. That name may not be familiar to a lot of you. The old timers in the room might remember his son, Judge Bill Mann, who was a common police court judge. But prior to that, his father was a judge. But his real claim to fame was he was the first prosecutor in the first Sam Shepard murder case in the early 1950s. Um, so now uh, I managed to get this photo out. I actually got a few of these, but in the interest of time, I only picked one. This is the jury view at Gene's Funny House in June, 1958. The jurors are going to the back room. You can see no minors and, and they're going back there to, uh, to observe it. I, I, I noted that it was, uh, it was an integrated jury. Uh, there were blacks on the jury and the jury seemed to be all women. So I'm not sure if the theory of the prosecution was, hey, we need to get all women on this jury, or the defense wanted women because the defendant was a woman. You know, it's it's an interesting twist. It's not really explored in any of the articles, uh, the composition of the jury beyond uh, that it was a lot of women. Now, Javaris uh, is convicted on June 25th, 1958. She is sentenced by John J. Mann to one to seven years at the Marysville Reformatory. And as he says, as an example, and he said this uh, on the record, let others who feel they have a license to show these films take notice that they do so at their own peril. The jury has spoken for the average citizen of this community. They don't want any part of such filth. So uh, that was certainly uh, that judge's view of what had happened. Uh, now, we're going to move on to the Jacobellis case, uh, which uh, I think is really a, a good time capsule that kind of captures America at a certain point in time and in the midst of what is about to be a great deal of changes. But we'll look through at some of the people that were involved in this case and how it unfolded. So let's start out with November of 1959. What was going on in this country? Well, uh, the murders that were the subject of Truman Capote's book, In Cold Blood, occurred in November of 1959. Uh, the former Cleveland DJ, Alan Freed, who coined the phrase rock and roll, and Alan Freed, I believe, he's buried, his ashes are buried, or they were scattered at Lakeview Cemetery. And there's a, a great uh, kind of a monument, a jukebox headstone to him in Lakeview, if you're ever over there. But he got fired from WABC in New York City over the payola scandal, which was where DJs were paying, playing certain records uh, and getting paid to do so, uh, rather than necessarily on their on the on the song's merit. Uh, the New American Football League uh, had its first owners meeting in Minneapolis uh, in November of '59, and there was a plot to kidnap 11-year-old Prince Charles. Who knew? Um, so that was what was going on in '59. Uh, and of course, in 1958, uh, La Amance, The Lovers, is filmed in France, but it reaches the shores here in America in November of 1959. Uh, so now it stars Jeanne Moreau. You love to say that name. Uh, and uh, she was born in Paris in 1928. Her father was French and her mother was English. They were both Catholic. She had a very, very long film career in France, uh, never really made it in America in the sense of being a star in America. She spoke fluent English. In fact, she spoke several languages, uh, was really a, a superstar, often described as the next Bridget Bardot at, at the time. Uh, so The Lovers was a huge film, a huge success in Europe. Uh, so when it arrived here in November of 1959, uh, it ended up at a lot of the certain theaters that would show more cutting edge films, even at that time. So this is a scene that you just saw of, uh, of her from The Lovers. And uh, just a brief little backstory on the film. Uh, what it is, is she plays the uh, a bored young housewife of a rich French like aristocrat. And there is a traveling uh, archeologist that happens to come through uh, town and they happen to meet and of course uh, he's invited somehow or other through some friendships to have dinner at the at the family home with her husband and her and their friends and and of course uh, sparks happen right as they do in life and these two end up having an affair and then uh, Jeanne Moreau runs off with the uh, 
with the archaeologist in that really cool Citron CV2 car that I will tell you, uh, I would love and love to have one of those. But, um, you know, when I looked at this and I tried to read back on the history of the case, I thought it's really interesting that what what the obscenity issue seemed to be about, this is me editorializing a little bit, it was more about we lived in a very patriarchal society where the man was in control and the outrage of this film in some ways might have been a woman showing independence, doing her own thing, and then running off with a younger man. I mean, if this had been, if you think about the reversals, if this had been a film about a guy who left his wife and ran off, I don't know that we would have made it to the U.S. Supreme Court in 19, but maybe we would have, I, I don't know, but so 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 why did this film like i showed you the clip but there wasn't a whole lot more in this movie other than what you saw in that clip there's a little more i'm not going to deny that but it wasn't outright like uh you know porn sex or something like that that somebody might might take issue with but it it you know it it was not something that was that uh, racy by even by well certainly not by today's standards but uh, what happened was W. Ward Marsh, he was, a, he was a film critic for The Plain Dealer at the time. He was born in 1893. He joined The Plain Dealer in 1915 as a police reporter, a religious editor, a religion editor. Well, that ought to give you a clue there. And a copy editor. And he wrote a review of the film in the day prior to its first showing. And he said that the film, The Lovers, was shockingly nasty. He described it as screen pornography. And he ended his review by saying, The Lovers lights every censorship torch. Well, guess what's going to happen when you write that in a major daily newspaper? It's going to get the attention of some people. Now, the film was scheduled to be shown here at the Heights Art Theater at 2781 Euclid Heights Boulevard. It's very close by. It's, like I say, 1.9 miles away. You can go by there today and see it. It's still there in all its glory. It looks virtually the same. The marquee has changed a little bit. And we'll talk a little bit more about the theater uh, towards the end of this presentation. But uh, the theater is there. Um, it, it was an interesting theater because it was owned by a family. It first opened in 1919 as, a art, as the Heights Theater. In 54, it was renamed the Hertz Art Theater. And it was dedicated to showing only distinguished motion pictures of international prestige. It was part of a chain of 14 theaters operated by the Art Theater Guild of Columbus, Ohio, and that entity was owned by a fellow named Louis Shear of Columbus and another gentleman, Edward Shulman of Highland Park, Michigan. So they were the film uh, or the theater owners. Now, this fella is Chief Edward F. Gaffney. He was the chief of the Cleveland Heights Police Department in November of 1959. He served his 18 years as chief of that uh, department. Now, Gaffney read the uh, Marsh's review, apparently, uh, at least news accounts suggest that, and uh, he decided to tell one of his captains on the force to go and watch the movie and tell me what you think of it. So the very first night was November 12th that the movie was going to be shown, and Gaffney sends a gentleman over, and that's Earl J. Gordon. He's the gentleman seated, uh, as you look at that picture on the left, uh, with the film canister right in front of him, he sends uh, Earl Gordon over uh, on Thursday, November 12th, 1959, to watch the film. Uh, now, it's interesting, the news reports say that uh, Captain Gordon took his wife with him to the film. That's mentioned in the news article. Of course, there's no reference what Mrs. Gordon thought of the movie. <laughs> I don't know what she thought of it, but, <laughs> but Earl Gordon went back to Gaffney, and then they got uh, a fellow named uh, King Wilmot, who was the law director of Cleveland Heights at the time, along with uh, another gentleman that was the uh, prosecutor, and they started to talk about what, what did you think of the film and do you think it was obscene? Now, Gordon was an interesting figure. He joined the Cleveland Heights Police Department in 1946. He served three combat campaigns in Europe during World War II. He was a sergeant with George Patton's Third Army. He earned a bronze star in the Battle of the Bulge. He was born in Cleveland and graduated from Brush High School, and he was a self-taught organ and guitar player. So a little bit of background on Gordon. 
Well, Gordon comes back and he tells uh, the law director, the city prosecutor, and Chief Gaffney that I think the film is obscene. So they contact the then Cuyahoga County prosecutor, John T. Corrigan, and this is uh, John T. Corrigan here. Um, and he says, well, I'm not going to take anybody's word for it. I will go and see the film as well. So now we have Gordon, Corrigan, Gaffney, and a whole slot of people off to the Heights Art Theater for the Friday showing of The Lovers. And uh, Corrigan was uh, a, a very renowned figure. I was hired by Corrigan, John T. Corrigan. I worked for John T. Corrigan in the prosecutor's office towards the end of his career. Uh, he also was a World War II veteran. He, and a lot of people don't know this, but he lost his uh, one of his eyes in the Battle of the Bulge. He was elected prosecutor in 1956, um, and this was during his first term. He certainly didn't shy away from uh, controversial cases, so uh, off they went. Well, that night, they decided to seize the film and arrest uh, the theater manager. So this was the next day's front page news article in the, in the Cleveland Plain Dealer, Police Seize Heights Theater Film. Um, so it was really the uh, front page news. Now, there were 400 patrons in the audience who paid $1.50 per ticket to see the film. And at 8.45, the police confiscated the film. It came in five canisters. They closed the theater, and they arrested the theater manager, who was Nico Jacobellis. The police were met by jeers and catcalls from the crowd, but everyone got their money back. Everyone got their money back. And then police took Jacobellis to the Cleveland Heights police station where he was briefly jailed until his attorney arrived and he was immediately released on a hundred dollars bond. So this already starts into play now, uh, a big story. The media's got it. He's been arrested. And so this is Nico Jacobellis. Uh, he was born in Bari, Italy. He came to Cleveland in 1948 on an educational scholarship. He received a bachelor's degree in English and Spanish and a master's degree in dramatic arts from Case Western Reserve University. Uh, Jacobellis started managing the Heights Art Theater in June of 55. He also managed Westwood Art Theater on the west side, as well as the Continental Art Theater in East Cleveland. He also hosted Italian radio shows, acted at the Cleveland Playhouse, wrote subtitles for Italian films. He lectured on films at Lake Erie College and Kent State. And at the time of his arrest, he lived in an apartment building at 10834 Deering Avenue. I went by there, it's no longer there. Um, so obviously, Jacobellis' arrest was big news in Cleveland. And Jacobellis was quoted as saying he didn't feel the film was obscene and noted it was highly rated in Europe. Now, this is Thomas L. Osborne. He was one of the chief lieutenants in John T. Corrigan's prosecutor's office in the 1950s. And he was a very much a religious moralist. Uh, he lived in the Collinwood area in Cleveland. Uh, to give you a sense of his religious perspective, his oldest daughter was an Ursuline nun and his twin brother was a Catholic priest. So not hard to see where he was gonna fall on the line of this meter. Um, so he graduated from Cathedral Latin uh, and from John Carroll University Cum Laude in 1938. He was an accomplished debater, and he was on the team that won a debate against Oxford College of Cambridge, England. He served in Europe during World War II and graduated from Cleveland Marshall College of Law Cum Laude in 1947. So uh, clearly a talented guy, uh, but clearly also probably had a clear side that he was, was viewing this from. Now, let's see. Here is Bernie Stuplinski. He was the second chair prosecutor who worked on the case. And I remember Bernie Stuplinski very well. He was a really great, uh, a really great guy and a, an excellent lawyer. He went on to become a U.S. attorney. At one time, he represented Teamster Jackie Presser and the mob and things. He was also one of the guys who defended the Kent State Guardsmen in the Kent State shootings. He was the lawyer that got the guardsmen off in that trial. So he was a really accomplished guy, a uh, fantastic guy. He also got his law degree here at Case Western Reserve University. It's interesting enough too, on D-Day in 1944, he joined the army. He went to Fort Sill, uh, Fort Still, I think that's in Oklahoma. And the day he got there, he entered a boxing contest and beat everybody. He won the, won the title that day. So he was a tough guy, but a gentleman, a real gentleman. I remember him well from the Justice Center. Um, this is Bernard Klingman. Now, Jacobellis is the, 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 the individuals that I said own the theater immediately got a lawyer. 
and uh, they they went to Bennett Kleinman at at uh, Bennett Kleinman Con and uh, I'm sorry, uh, Con Kleinman, Janowitz and Arnson. I think they're still around. Are they not in some form? I think they are. Um, but Kleinman was born in Cleveland. He went to Glenville. He received his bachelor's degree in business administration from the old Fenn College in 1940. He served in the Army in the Pacific in World War II. He got his law degree from Cleveland Marshall in 1947. He was a, an, uh, an IRS agent for three years, and uh, he also was a certified public accountant. He's very prominent in Cleveland's Irish community. So he was the lead lawyer for Jacobellis and the theater going into this case. Now, another lawyer that came into the picture was Seymour Terrell. He is a legendary figure among the Ohio ACLU. Uh, he was involved with a number of high profile First Amendment cases. He was also one of the lawyers that got involved with Dow Dowry Mapp's case and moved it towards a First Amendment argument uh, rather than so much a search argument. And he was a, a very famous lawyer, uh, really a, a, a very accomplished figure. So Jacobellis had two really, really good lawyers. Now, the case would be tried at the old Cuyahoga County Criminal Courts building. Isn't it great how back then we didn't name our public buildings? We just <laughs> This would have been the Earl Turner building. It was <laughs> not Earl, you haven't been around that long, but <laughs> but uh, it, it was it, it located at 1560 East 21st Street. Now, here's an interesting story about this place. It had about six or seven courtrooms. Uh, and it had a big rotunda where all the lawyers would gather. But there was a 350-bed jail in the tower portion of it. Now, the old timers used to tell me that when the bad decision came down or an inmate got convicted or there was some sense of wrongfulness, the inmates would stuff the toilets with toilet paper, flush all the things, and the water would come pouring down. The lesson of life is, if you are an architect, do not build the jail above the judge's chambers. <laughs> well, I mean... That's just, you know, so revised code 2905-34 at the time, uh, knowing this is what this is what Jacobellis was charged with, knowingly having possession or control of certain obscene, lewd, or or what is that, levacious? There you go. Thank you. Shout out to all of you. Uh, and then the second count was exhibiting it. So we have a possession count and we have an exhibition count. And the penalty uh, in the ORC at that time was one to seven years in the Ohio State Reformatory. Now, interestingly enough, I did not know this till I started to research this case, but 294507 allowed a defendant to waive a jury and be tried by a panel of three judges at the trial court. Very interesting, very unique. Now, as we know, a death penalty case, right? You could waive a jury and have three judges hear it. But back then, you could, uh, you could have any case waive and, and have it tried by three. So uh, the standard in America at that time was the 1957 Supreme Court decision, Roth versus United States. It defined obscenity as material whose dominant theme taken as a whole appeals to the Puritan interest, to the average person applying contemporary community. And the sense, the, the focus on that was always local standards, local community. Uh, and that will play a, a bigger role in the outcome of this case. But Roth was the standard that was in place then when this case was charged. Now, the three trial judges were Judge Roy F. McMahon, Judge William Jennings McDermott, and Judge John D. Pincura. Uh, so they were the three judges selected. Now, interestingly enough, Pincura was not a Cuyahoga County Common Police Court judge. He was a Lorain County Common Police Court judge. I haven't been able to find why. They got a visiting judge for it, but they did. They got a visiting judge. Perhaps some of the other judges just recused or didn't want to be involved in an obscenity case. Uh, but Pecura was picked as the third judge. McMahon was kind of the lead judge because he was the most senior. Now, let's talk a little bit about Roy McMahon. Native Clevelander, he attended university school, also Case Western Reserve University, graduated from Ohio Northern University College of Law in Ada, Ohio. He served in the infantry in World War II, was discharged with the rank of captain. He went on to serve in the Ohio legislature in the 1940s and 50s. He was first elected judge in 1957 and was a Democrat, and he was a Presbyterian. Uh, unusual for a guy named McMahon to be a Presbyterian and not a Catholic, but he was a Presbyterian. Um, William J. McDermott. Now, McDermott was born in Akron in 1898. He eventually came to Cleveland. He graduated from Glenville. He went to Heidelberg College, and he interrupted his studies 
to join the U.S. Army in World War I. He returned to Heidelberg after the war. He went to law school here at Case Western Reserve University. He graduated in 1924. It was actually the old Western Reserve University. And he began his law career. Uh, he was in private practice. He was a U.S. attorney. He was appointed to the municipal court in August 1st of 1939. He ran in 1946 for a seat on the juvenile court. In 1951, he took leave to run for mayor against Tom Burke. What a suicide mission that must have been. Uh, he lost the race, though, by only 21,000 votes. And then in 1953, resigned from the bench to run against Anthony J. Celebrezzi for mayor, a real uh, suicide mission <laughs> back in those days. Uh, but he ran unsuccessfully to the common police bench in 56. Um, but he was eventually appointed and uh, he was a great athlete. Uh, he served as a referee for high school sports um, and interesting guy. He was a Republican. Um, uh, so the third uh, figure was John D. Pincura. Now, this guy's an interesting background. Born in Chester, Pennsylvania, raised in Lorraine. His father ran a grocery store. He went to Penn State University and I looked him up. He was the starting quarterback at Penn State. He graduated in 1928, and he was 19 and 8 as a quarterback. There you go. Who knew? After he got out of Penn State, though, he went to Ohio State for law school. <laughs> I don't think there was that much strife back in those days, you know. But uh, he graduated in 1932. He was he was the Lorraine City Auditor for 18 years. And he was initially elected in Lorraine in 1951, a big outdoorsman, and he was big with the local Boy Scouts. Now, this is the Cleveland Film and Exchange Building at East 21st and Payne Street. And this is an interesting um, uh, slide because what happened during the trial was they decided to show the juries, the film, the jurors, the film, and they needed a place to show the film at. Well, lo and behold, literally across the street from the old criminal court building was this building, the film exchange building. And this is where movies were, were brought in and, and, you know, assembled and all that kind of stuff and sent out. So they had a screening room there. So they brought the jury across the street and they put them in, in a room in the film building and they had everything set up to film it. And at the, and this was reported in the newspaper right before they were ready to show the film to the jury, they discovered that there were four extra seats in the room. Now there was a huge contention of people watching this trial, the gallery, so to speak. And the news reports say that four middle-aged women burst past everybody and got those last four seats. So there you go. So when the trial ends, June 14th of 1960, Nico Jacobellis is convicted of both counts. He's fined $2,000 on one and 500 on the other. They don't impose any jail time. But I thought I would take this out of the journal entry because I've been on the Court of Appeals for over 20 years, and I could never write something quite as compelling as this. And I almost want to read this because I think this is just so much, and I don't know if any of the clerks that are here could ever come up with this either. But in a tantalizing and increasing tempo, the sexual appetite is whetted, and the levacious thoughts and lustful desires are intensely stimulated. The apex is reached when the wife of the publisher and the itinerant archeologist engage in protracted love play, give full vent to their emotions and indulge themselves in sexual activity. Have you ever read a journal entry quite like that? <laughs> I say not. So we're gonna have to get that file. <laughs> So this is Jacobellus. Now, interestingly enough, he gets he gets held in jail. And because the fine wasn't paid, he spent six days in jail waiting for somebody to pay his twenty five hundred dollar fine. And eventually Kleinman pays it. And, and you know, it, it was interesting because Kleinman's was representing both uh, Jacobellus and the theater, man, the theater ownership. Uh, but eventually the theater owners did pay pay the fine and Jacobellus got out. And that is uh, Jacobellus's assistant uh, that's in the slide with him. Her name was Susan. I can't remember her last name, but uh, uh, it's, it's in the materials. So he gets out. Now, immediately, Kleinman decides to appeal this to 8th District Court of Appeals. And back in those days, the Court of Appeals only had three judges. And they were like the same three judges forever, it seemed like. Uh, these guys were all first elected, uh, or not all of them, but they came on in like the early 40s, late 30s, and they were on there until the court expanded in the early 60s. So it was a good 20, 25 years. They heard virtually every major case that came out of Cleveland, Terry v. Ohio, Map v. Ohio, and of course, 
this case. Uh, so let's uh, let's just briefly uh, talk about these these uh, three guys while I have a chance. And they are kind of interesting uh, when you hear about these people's backgrounds. So that that's Kabachi on the left, uh, and he was born in Hungary in 1893. Came to the United States at age one. Uh, his father was a Hungarian minister, um, and he was a member. His father was a member of the Hungarian Parliament. He went to school in Connecticut and Chicago, but he graduated from Central High in Cleveland. In 1917, he earned a Bachelor of Science in Chemistry from the University of Pennsylvania. He worked at Westinghouse for a period of time. He became a chemist for the city of Cleveland while earning a bachelor's degree in law from Cleveland College of Law, cum laude, in 1922. In 1927, he graduated from John Marshall Law School. He served as a city prosecutor. He was elected to the Cleveland Municipal Court in 1930. He served there for 15 years, then seven years as a common police court judge, then went on to the Court of Appeals in the early 1950s. Uh, he was very much involved with all the nationality groups around Cleveland. Uh, but he also had a laboratory in his home, and he had a patent on a number of cleaning uh, uh, chemicals for cleaning uh, stone that was manufactured here and used internationally. So quite, quite a character. The middle guy is Judge Joy Seth Hurd. He was originally appointed to the Common Police Court bench in 1935 by Governor Martin Davey. He won election to that bench in 36 and 42 and then went on to the 8th District when he was appointed by Governor Frank Lauschi. He and his wife had 15 children and 63 grandchildren. Wow. Thank God we don't have phone books anymore, right? Packed with herds. Now, the last one is Judge Skeel on the, on the far right. He began his service in the Court of Appeals in 1941. He was a common police court judge from 32 to 41 and a Cleveland Muni judge from 24 to 32. In all, he served 43 years as a judge. Now, I found out something else about Judge Skeel. He actually ran for re-election after the age of 70, and nobody caught on and, and questioned it. And he actually served when he when he technically probably couldn't have served. So I don't know. I did the math, and that sounds kind of. But anyway, he was with the 322nd Machine Gun Battalion of the 83rd Division in France in World War I. Can you imagine these guys? Wow. He was dean of Cleveland Law School from 37 to 44 and participated in its merger with John Marshall to become Cleveland Marshall College of Law. And he was named the first president of that school in 1946. So quite an interesting background. Now, these guys affirm the decision uh, in a pure curium. Not, not one of them put their name on it, but they, they affirmed the conviction on May 25th of 1961. They cited to an earlier obscenity case that uh, justified the separation convictions for possession and exhibiting. And what case did they cite to? You guessed it, Javaris. That Javaris case came back and uh, reared its head again in this case. So the court also held that obscene material was not protected by the First Amendment, something that would become significant later. Okay, Charles Zimmerman, I can never do a presentation without putting a Charles Zimmerman slide in. He's my favorite. Ohio judge uh, because he served 35 years on the Supreme Court and he was so unsure about his elections that he never got an apartment or a house in Columbus. He used to hitchhike or take the bus from Springfield to Columbus every week and he slept on a cot in his office for 35 years. There's a real political figure for you. So interesting guy. Now, the judge that would end up writing the majority opinion for the uh, for the Supreme Court was not a member of the court. He was actually on the 4th District Court of Appeals, and he was from Pickaway County. And if anybody's out there, shout out to Mike Hess from Pickaway County. Uh, uh, he served on the, on, the, on the 4th District and then came onto this case, and he ended up being the writer. Now, he's a very experienced public servant with a diverse background. He was a common police court judge for a number of years. Born in Pickaway County, graduated from Ohio Wesleyan, Ohio Northern University College of Law in 1933. I practiced law in Circleville, Ohio. He also served as mayor of his original hometown, Williamsport, from 34 to 39. He was a state rep for a number of times. He was in the Army in May of 1942. Uh, very active in the Rotary Clubs in his area uh, and active with the Boy Scouts. Now, he wrote a very, I thought, great impassioned opinion. He, he almost is apologizing to Jacobellus for affirming his conviction during the whole writing. And he talks about uh, history is replete with examples of nations that have lost their moral compass and their moral fiber. And he goes through the, this 
And he's kind of talking about the separation of the legislature from the judiciary and how the judiciary shouldn't intrude on the legislative boundaries. But, but through the whole thing, when you read it, you almost sense that he's just apologizing. I'm sorry I have to do this. I'm sorry I have to do this. I'm sorry I have to do this, but we have to have some standard and this is it. So it's a very fascinating piece to read, but then afterwards he makes short shrift of all the other arguments and they affirm the conviction in 1962. Now, obviously during the pendency of this case, America's going through a lot of changes. Uh, and just to focus on the one aspect of sex, let's just say for sake, you know, in the early fifties, the catcher in the rye comes out and then on the road, Jack Kirk's novel, and then Allen Ginsberg's works, all this stuff is getting out there. But of course, mainstream America is not so much paying any attention to that, but this stuff is out there and permeating the society. Oh, geez. Sorry. I'll take that. Um, so we, of course we get Elvis, little Richard, Chuck Berry, you know, the big, th this is the change, you know, Elvis is starting to bring black music to white America. And, uh, all of a sudden white Americans are paying attention to people like little Richard and Chuck Berry. So there's all this is going on in the background is this case is moving up through the court system. Uh, of course the films of the era rebel without a cause comes out and starts the whole thing down. Remember Jim back is from Gilligan's Island was in uh, rebel without a cause. If you're young and you haven't watched Rebel Without a Cause, not a, not a bad film to get a sense of that that Americana back in that day. Also, Blackboard Jungle, Sidney Portier was in this movie, and it's a very, very uh, interesting film because it portrays uh, high school in a much more realistic way than it would have, you know, in a lot of these other campy films that came out in that time. Uh, this is Efren London. He is a very famous um, uh attorney uh, out of New York City. He was a law professor. He specialized in constitutional law. He was a defender of free speech and civil liberties. He taught constitutional law at New York University, and he was born in Brooklyn, New York. He served as an army officer during World War II. He also served as a special investigator in post-war Germany for the United Nations War Crimes Commission investigating Nazis. He would put the focus of Jacobellis' appeal on the constitutional question of how to define obscenity. So as Jacobellis' case is moving up, the media is paying more and more attention to it, not only in the Cleveland area, but across the nation. It's gaining uh, uh, a perspective. And now you're seeing higher profile lawyers getting involved in the case, getting involved in the issue. Uh, a very interesting uh, uh, change that was, that was happening. Now, the U.S. Supreme Court, the case was argued twice. Very unusual that it would be argued twice. Uh, first on March 26th of 1963, and then again on April 1st, 1964. And I think this may have reflected the change in our society that was going on with sexual morals. That, you know, think of all that happened between March 63, you know, Dr. King's March on Washington, John F. Kennedy's assassination. There's a lot of change going on in America. And so, I, you know, it's possible that they wanted to take another look at this case. Um, but the big significant thing that I think to take away is that we're no longer going to look at questions of obscenity on a local standard because it's a constitutional issue. We're going to look at it from a national standard. So after viewing the film, the court held it was not obscene. Now, the next day in the plain dealer, you can see there, I kind of cut it highlighted in yellow, high court clears lovers. So this was a big, a big story still. Even now, we're, we're five years after the raid. And uh, it takes five years to get through it. But the court clears Jacobellis in June of 1964. Now, Justice Potter Stewart would write the majority opinion for the United States Supreme Court in Jacobellis. And he's only known for one thing, really. <laughs> and, and everybody knows it. Uh, and and it, his, he's often missed. This is often misquoted. Everybody says, I know it when I see it. But the real quote was, I shall not today attempt further to define the kinds of material I understand to be em embraced within that shorthand description, and perhaps I never could succeed in intelligibly doing so, but I know it when I see it, and the motion picture involved in this case is not that. So that's where the phrase comes from, and we use it today in so many other ways. Now, one of the interesting things I looked at was what was the reaction, especially with the media, right after this, and I, I found this little uh, editorial and it, it, it basically said, not so fast, you know, just because the Supreme Court said this was OK, this is still a warning to theater owners to be careful about what you're going to exhibit and how you're going to exhibit it. So there was a lot of pushback on this, despite the, the change that had come with this decision. So this is 
what was at the former site of Gene's Funhouse. This is the Ohio Savings Bank building. That's at Vincent and East 9th Street. For Clevelanders, I, I got to throw this in there so you know, you get a perspective of where it's at. It's just a short ride from here. This is the Hearts, Heights Art Theater today. What I think is the most ironic aspect of this case is on Sunday mornings, the Heights Art Theater is now used as, you guessed it, a church. It is a church. So the theater is still there. In fact, the Cleveland, uh, the, the Metropolitan Bar, Cleveland Metropolitan Bar has a great CLE series where you go around and visit like historic sites. And they did one this summer there where they went to the theater and you could, you know, they did like a little overview of the case and that. So I thought it was really kind of cool that they did that. Um, this is where the criminal courts building used to be. It's a parking lot today um, uh, at over at East 21st Street. Uh, this is the film building. It's still there. The film building is still there. You can still go by there. there those four empty seats might still be there if any, anybody wants to try to grab them. Uh, but yeah, the, you know, as, as, as movies changed and, you know, the digital era, obviously it's not used as that anymore, but it is still called the film building today. Um, this is the old courthouse where it was argued in front of the three uh, judges same courtroom that we have today uh, that we hear cases in every day. Um, Terry v. Ohio was heard there. Matt v. Ohio was heard there. And this case was heard there. Uh, the Javaris family, I'll fill you in on what happened to them. Angelo Javaris, um, he would uh, be released from prison after his wife's, wife's arrest. Um, he would end up selling Gene's Funhouse during the development of the Erie View Tower project and then some other projects along East 9th Street. Um, he eventually moved it across the street briefly to 1854 East 9th Street. He died in January 1966. His wife was paroled in June of 1961, and she died in November of 1976. They had two children, a son and a daughter. Their son, Gregory, took over the business. He turned them into two bars, but he ended up having a lot of legal problems. The bars got raided. He got charged with drugs and just a lot of, it was not a happy ending, and he died in 1999. Now, that famous um, Plain Dealer uh, film critic, Ward Marsh, um, he, uh, he uh, also taught history, uh, enjoyment, and the criticism of movies right here at Case Western Reserve College. He died on June 23rd, 1971. He was survived by his wife. They only had one child who died tragically in 1967. A lot of his movie memorabilia, including some personally bound copies of different scripts from Cecil B. DeMille, were donated to the Cleveland Public Library in his name. He's buried in Hudson. Uh, Captain Gordon, uh, who arrested Jacobellis and seized the film, he was in charge of the Cleveland Heights Detective Bureau for the last 20 years of his 31-year police career. He retired in 1977. He died on November 11, 2008, at age 84. The trial judges, uh, Judge Mann, died July 13 of 1990 due to heart failure. Judge Jennings died at 66. Judge George McMonagall, the infamous George McMonagall, was appointed to replace him, or the famous George McMonagall was appointed to replace him in 19, uh, uh, after his death. Anyway, he died February 25th, 1964. Judge Pincura retired in 1977. Oh, I'm sorry, did I go too far? I'm sorry, John Pincura, he died in 1977, I'm sorry, he died in 1987 uh, at age 82. Now, very fast, uh, Kovacci died in 1982 in North Carolina. Uh, Judge Skeel died uh, in 1968 at age 80, and he's buried in Lakeview Cemetery. And Judge Hurd, I got that much time? Wow, I'm watching that clock. <laughs> uh, Judge Hurd uh, became ill in the old courthouse on Friday, October 4th, 1963. He was taken to St. John's Hospital and died on October 6th, 1963. Uh, he is buried in Holy Cross Cemetery. Uh, at the time of Hurd's death in 1963, appellate judges were paid $19,000 a year. And common police judges earned $17,000 a year. Interesting. The defense attorneys... Um, Bernard Kleiman and his wife had an apartment in Tel Aviv, Israel, that they visited for two months every year during his career. Uh, he received the Israeli Bonds Award in 1966 and an award from the Jewish National Fund in 1972. He retired in 1990 after he suffered a stroke. He died on July 4th, 1998 at his home at the age of 79. Seymour Terrell, second figure there, I'm sorry. 
Seymour Terrell, the second uh, lawyer, continued to represent a number of individuals on First Amendment issues. He died on August of 1994. And Efren London, who won all nine cases, he argued before the U.S. Supreme Court. Uh, and he also defended Lenny Bruce uh, after his obscenity arrest in 1964. He won that case after Bruce died. But he died in New York City on June 12, 1999, at age 79. Very briefly on the prosecutors. On Friday, September 28, 1962, during Jacob Ellis's appeal, Osborne was on a panel discussing the dangers of obscenity in Lakewood. The next night, he was scheduled to give a talk to a group of students at Borromeo Cemetery, Seminary that included his son, Frank. And uh, many, many would remember Frank from Taft Stennis and Weston Hurd. Uh, and uh, Right before he gave his speech, he keeled over and had a heart attack and a stroke and died. Stuplinsky died on June 24th of 2011, and John T. Corrigan died um, uh, in 2003. And uh, they actually, all of us who worked for him, raised money privately and put up a statue of him. He was very well regarded. He's a controversial figure to a lot of people, but if you worked for him, you were very loyal to him. And this statue was erected at Huntington Park in his honor. Now, very quickly, Potter Stewart. Uh, he would also sit on Katz versus United States and Chimble versus California. Uh, he died on December 7th, 1985, and was buried in Arlington National Cemetery. Jeanne Moreau went on to make many films. She died at the age of 89 on July 31st, 2017. Jacobellis continued to manage the Heights Art Theater until 1967. He then became an advertising man for 20th Century Fox, film, Fox Films. He later transferred to New York City. Uh, he retired in 1982. He never expressed personal bitterness over the case. He died on Sunday, November 12, 2000 at White Plains, New York. It was 41 years to the day of his arrest and the ex exhibition of the film. So um, anyway, that's my story. Uh, I hope you enjoyed it. And I think we finished on time. So I thank you very much.